Good day and a very warm welcome on behalf of NTI Audio. Well, there is a, a nice anecdote in my family about a grand, grand uncle of mine who, as a young boy, came back from school and his mother asked him, what did you learn today? And his response was zero plus zero is zero. The intention behind his response is quite obvious. He didn't want to get bothered with further inquiries in that direction. Uh, but from the perspective of an audio expert, uh, it is quite interesting that zero and plus zero is not always zero, like in the example that you see here on this uh, whiteboard. Uh, so let us dig deeper into that by uh, starting the presentation. And I want to present myself. My name is Markus Becker. I'm moderating this webinar and I'm assisted today by Greg Schmiedle, our product manager, who is taking care of your input. On the left hand side, you see the topics that we have prepared for today's presentation. We start with a look on why sound levels are typically expressed in dB and what does that mean. We will show you how to sum up sound levels from different sound sources or to sum up band limited levels. We will also explain the difference between incoherent and coherent signals, which plays a very important role in this whole aspect. And the green shade behind these first four topics indicates that each of them will be accompanied by a practical presentation. After that, I will summarize the key aspects and, uh, of this uh, presentation and add some more hints and tips. I expect that this whole webinar will last about half an hour. So let us take a look on what sound actually is. Um, when we take a loudspeaker with a moving membrane, we could say that this loudspeaker is creating changes in the air pressure. The static air pressure around us is of course not affected by the dynamic air pressure. These waves that are created by this loudspeaker, it, that is what we perceive as a sound. And that's why we call it sound pressure level, because it's changes of the air pressure. Well, when we plot the typical air pressure levels or air pressure changes of sounds on this scale here, on this linear scale, P is pressure expressed in Pascal, which is the standardized unit for pressure. We would start down here at a very low level of 20 micropascal, which is the hearing threshold of our human ear. In other words, very well-trained listeners will be able to still hear sounds at that low level, but not below. Continuing with whispering, a conversation between two people, a truck driving by next to you on the road, or even a helicopter which might be landing in front of your door. Um, well, you see the sound pressure or the pressure level is slowly increasing, but still it's pretty low, deep, low, deep down in the, in the single value uh, pressure values. And maybe you ask yourself, well, why did I plot this um, silly um, scale up to 200? Well, as soon as we continue, you're going to see why I did so. For instance, uh, by adding here a police siren, which is already pretty much higher typically, or a jet flying by close to you would be uh, coming up to 63 uh, Pascal. And when we're taking a look at the really heavy, big fireworks, these uh, big loud explosions uh, that are included and if that would happen in the vicinity of you you could measure as pressure levels of up to 200 pascal that is the reason why we actually have to uh, plot this scale up to that level but what is a little bit annoying is that most of the events that are bothering us at all that are uh, confronting us in, in our daily work are really down here in this very low level. So the question is, is there a better way of displaying these different levels? And the answer is yes, by calculating the logarithm of these 
pressure levels. And that's what we do here. You see this formula translates the linear Pascal pressure level into a logarithmic level, the decibel. Decibel generally stands for a logarithmic scale. And here you see now the effect is quite obvious. We, are, we have a much nicer distributed um, line of these events that we have seen already here on the left hand side over this new decibel range. Down here we start with the hearing threshold, the whispering, the conversation and so on and so forth. But you see it's quite um, correlating to our human perception of saying, okay, uh, conversation is twice as loud, maybe a little bit more than whispering and so on and so forth. So this scale is much better correlating to our perceived uh, impression of sound levels. So um, another thing that needs to be mentioned here is we could of course also go the way back from a decibel level, sound pressure level, back to the pressure level here expressed in Pascal. By the way, here this micro 20 micropascal and up here, that is the hearing threshold that we introduced here at the very beginning. Now, there are two things that are really important to know. First of all, zero dB sound pressure level does not mean that this is nil. It does not mean that it, is, it does not correspond to any sound pressure level changes at all. The characteristic of a logarithmic scale is that it has no zero in terms of nil. You go down and a negative logarithmic value means nothing else than that the translated linear level is getting smaller and smaller. smaller. And uh, you can see that here on the hints, so zero dB does not mean nil. It is still a sound pressure level. Hardly uh, hear audible, but it is still a sound pressure level. Another thing that um, you may notice is that increasing the sound pressure level by 6 dB corresponds to doubling the pressure level expressed in Pascal. Or when we have a difference of 20 dB on the logarithmic scale, we have a multiplication of 10 of the Pascal value. So 10 times higher Pascal value means 20 dB higher sound pressure level. What is really important uh, when we talk about dB is that this is a relative unit. Maybe you now understand better my uh, sketch from the last slide. Relative means dB always refers to a reference value. And in case of the dB SPL, this reference value are these 20 micropascal, the hearing threshold. Uh, when we take a look at another dB unit, the dB volt, this is an electrical unit. This unit refers to one volt. Or maybe you have already seen when you are active in the world of audio, the dBU. dBU refers to 0 0.775 volt, which is almost the same as the old dBm. Um, if you heard about that unit. Anyway, dBU or this um, unit refers to um, one milliwatt at 600 ohm, which you can translate into this zero, 0 0.775. But bottom line, really important, dB always refers to a reference value. And here we have the 20 micropascal in case of dBSPL. Second, we have uh, some dB values that will uh, occur again and again in your life. For instance, the 94 or the 114 dB SPL, they correspond almost exactly to one Pascal or to 10 Pascal. And an example when you will see that is when you are using a microphone calibrator because uh, microphone calibrators are typically creating a sound pressure level of either 94 and or 114 dB SPL. So that is the reference value for a microphone calibration. I will show you that uh, just in a minute in my practical presentation. And when we talk about microphone sensitivity, we have to state that the output voltage of a microphone for instance, at one Pascal, if that would be 24 microvolt, then the microphone sensitivity would be 24 microvolt per Pascal. It's quite obvious. 
as an alternative, you could of course also express the microphone sensitivity in dB volt per Pascal. Both millivolt and dB volt are electrical units and that is what it is about correlating the voltage, the output voltage of a microphone to the uh, sound pressure level that is actually present. Whether it is 20 volt for millivolt or whether it's dB volt depends of course on the specification of the manufacturer of the microphone or whatever you prefer. So let us uh, take a first look at a practical presentation. I have here a microphone connected to an FX100, which is driven by this PC. I have plugged a microphone calibrator on it. And here, just as a reminder, that was the formula on how to translate decibel into Pascal. We're gonna, because we're going to use that just in a minute, keep in mind this microphone calibrator can create either 94 or 114 dB SPL. We are using the 94 in our ex um, example. And I just wanted to show you that also um, in this with this webcam. You see it here. We have the microphone with the calibrator. Here we have two additional talk boxes, which we will use in our next um, presentation. So let's get back here and switch over to the FX control. Uh, screen and I'm going to switch on my calibrator now, start the measurement and you see this microphone is reacting with about 24.4 millivolt uh, with the uh, sound pressure le level that is actually uh, present. So how can we translate that into the microphone sensitivity? Let me show you that with a second project that is um, based on this measurement as well. Here we have again the measurement from the microphone voltage and now we're going to calculate the microphone sensitivity according to this formula. First of all we translate the sound pressure level expressed in dB, the 94 dBs, dBSPL into the uh, sound pressure level expressed in Pascal and then we can calculate the sensitivity by dividing the microphone by this 1.002 that's the formula that you're going to see here. And as soon as I start the measurement, you will see here again, that is our measurement result on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, we see the sensitivity. And now you understand also why here we have a slightly higher voltage than you will see what you see here. The reason is because we have to divide this voltage by this 1.002 to get to the true sensitivity, the result we will see here. Okay, so um, let's get back to the presentation. So the next topic is about summing up sound pressure levels. And how do we do that? Uh, let's assume you have a number of loudspeakers with different sound pressure levels. Uh, you know the sound pressure level for each uh, loudspeaker, but you do not know the combination of all these different levels in your room. Um, can you calculate that? The answer is yes. All you need to do is to feed the individual levels of these loudspeakers into this formula here, calculating the result, and then you will get the overall sum of this uh, noise. There is a simplification of that formula. Let's suppose you have identical loudspeakers and they are all creating the same sound pressure level. In that case, you can calculate the overall sound pressure level with this simplified formula. We just need the sound level per loudspeaker and we add this parameter here with the logarithmic of the number of speakers. And when we do that in a concrete example with two talk boxes, which each of them creating 60 dB in one meter distance, then the result of this calculation is 63. And this is the first important uh, thing to notice. We remember the 0 plus 0 dB gives 3 dB. Here we have the answer why this is the case, because the 60 can be replaced by any number this part over here results in the result of 3. So 60 plus 3 is 63. But 0 plus 3 is 3. And 
that's why you understand that two sound sources with the same level will create a new sound level based on the level of each source plus 3 dB. And maybe you want to know how you, we can, whether we can add up the sound pressure levels of different bands. The answer is yes. Uh, when we have band limited levels, fractional octave, which means third octave, sixth octave, whatever, we can add these levels here in this formula. And maybe you already noticed this formula is the same as here above. Now we are just talking about band levels and this will give us the wide band result of this sound. But let me show you that as well in a practical presentation. So now I'm gonna connect my microphone with the XL2 and I'm gonna show you um, the screen of that XL2 just in a second. But before the microphone here is ex exposed to two talk boxes, which are lined up in exactly the same distance, calibrated, providing a calibrated sound level of 60 dB in a distance of one meter. So I need to start the, here it is. That is my uh, XL2 Projector Pro. So all I need to do is to remove the calibrator from my microphone. And as soon as I start one talk box, I'm gonna do that just in a second and I will be silent for a couple of seconds. Then you can see here in the bar large display what will be the result um, measurement of this sound pressure level. Maybe you heard the pink noise that was created by the talk box and you saw the result, it's close to 60 dB. Now I'm gonna repeat the same thing, but now I'm gonna switch on both talk boxes. I guess you saw the result. The combined sound level is 63 dB plus a little bit more because we have some background noise here, but you see quite accurately my prediction uh, was fulfilled. So 60 dB plus 60 dB gives 63 dB. Now let us do the second part of that, um, summing up the levels. Now we want to take a look at these octave band levels and we want to sum them up into a wide band level. And for that purpose, I'm gonna switch on the talk box again and start a 10 second LEQ measurement, which I will then use for my calculation. So the measurement was completed. You see 11 seconds of measurement. I can switch back here to my display. I got a result of 64 dB, 0.1. Now let us take a look what the calculation gives us. So for that purpose, I need to briefly disconnect my Excel 2 in order to download the data. Here is the Excel 2. I open the projects folder. And here this RTA um, file uh, contains my measurement results. Here, I'm gonna copy that now. And I enter that into a Excel sheet that I have prepared. So what, what is happening here? I'm having here my decibel values of the eight octave bands, which are translated then into linear Pascal values. And then I can sum up these Pascal values, translate it back into a DBSPL value. And that is my result here, this yellow field. Now let's compare that to what we had in the wide band measurement.
You remember, the wide band measurement gave us 64.1 dB and the calculated wide band result is 64.2. There is a slight uh, difference, but that is due to the shape of the filters that the instrument is using for this octave band analysis. So you see the result is the same as the wide band measurement. Let's get back to the presentation and continue. And uh, this is an important aspect you always have to keep in mind. So far, we have been talking about rules for incoherent signals. What does that mean? Here you see on the right hand side, a blue and a red signal. They apparently have more or less the same level, but they are different in terms of frequencies and phases. This could be, for instance, two persons talking to each other, it could be two music instruments or whatever kind of noise that is created. So these are not correlated, two signals are not correlating to each other, and that's why we call them incoherent due to the different frequencies and phases. So the formulas that I have showed you before, they apply on incoherent signals. I had already given that hint in brackets. But there are also coherent signals. What is the difference? Here we see two coherent signals, a blue and a red sine wave, having the same frequency and having a fixed phase relation. Um, they apparently correlate highly to each other. Well, depending on the phase, um, these two signals can super create a superposition, which would mean they double the overall level, they could extinguish each other or they could do everything in between. I'm going to show you that in my practical part just in a minute. So you see that it's much more delicate to, to deal with coherent signals because it depends strongly on where they are in, in, the, uh, in the room compared to incoherent signals. So if you are coping with coherent signals, you have to analyze the situation quite carefully. The good news is, in most practical real-world applications, we are dealing with incoherent signals. Some applications intentionally are using coherent signals, and then, as I said, you have to do that really very carefully to be in control of the effects. But let us take a practical look on this uh, topic. Here we have, again, a setup with our flexus analyzer. Now I'm using the electrical output signals of the generator, channel 1 and channel 2. I'm feeding them into a mixing console, and the mixing console creates a combined level, a superposition of these levels, and that's what we are going to analyze. So I switch over to the FX control software, and I open the corresponding project. First, I want to show you the wiring once again, FX analyzer connected to the mixing console, the two output channels, and the output of the mixing console is fed back to the analyzer input. Now here we see the level of channel one, the level of channel two, the frequency channel one, frequency channel two. Here on this graph, you're gonna see the two curves and just start them by starting the measurement. As soon as I unmute channel one, we see here the green curve that is created by channel one, and the blue curve is the sum of these two, two curves, the green and the red one. So here we have identical shape and level of blue and green because red is still muted. I could do the same, by the way, with the red, the second curve. Now the instrument is not triggering, but you see the red curve is identical to the blue one here, the output of the mixing console. The situation changes as soon as I unmute both channels. If I hover over it, you see we have the red curve and the green curve identical. And the result now is a superposition, which means doubling the output level. Same frequency, but doubled output level. Now, in order to let you better understand the impact of coherent signals, I'm going to switch to stereo mode and amend now slightly the frequency of the first signal. Now you see, sorry, that was a little bit too long. That's what I wanted. So a very slight increase of the frequency of one signal results in a continuous change 
of the phase between these two coherent signals and that results in a completely different and changing dynamic result. When they're overlapping, they are superposed, but as soon as they have a 180 degree phase relationship, they extinguish each other, it's happening now, and then you can have everything in between. And that explains why you have to be really careful when you are dealing with coherent signals because they can create pretty dramatic, dramatically different um, effects to the listener. Well, that was um, this part of my presentation and I want to go back to my PowerPoint presentation and summarize the key points that I mentioned in this webinar. I started with the explanation why sound pressure levels are typically expressed in dB just because this uh, display, this way represents our human perception. The physical background or the physiological background behind that is that our ear is actually a logarithmically working uh, device or organ. And that is why we are hearing that way. And that is why we should use the DB to get a good understanding, good uh, fun, um, representation of a sound pressure level. Then we have briefly explained the calculation of the microphone sensitivity. Take care that you are using the right, correct pressure level down here. We have uh, uh, shown you how to sum up two incoherent signals with the same level, just add 3 dB. Or if you're having incoherent signals with different levels, you can do that by using this formula, or you can use the same formula if you want to sum up band-limited levels. However, if you are coping with uh, coherent signals, be very careful because you cannot use this formula up here. It's getting much more complex because you have to take the phase into account as well. So uh, that's again the warning. I just want to repeat. If you know what you do, you can work with coherent signals, but typically, um, yeah, take care. And the good thing is normally um, in the real world, we are mostly working with incoherent signals. And the last point is, that a last hint, um, we have already had a webinar on a very similar topic. You see here the title of that webinar, Sound Level Definition Calculation Practice. You will find that webinar on our website together with many more. So if you know, want to know more about this overall topic, take a look at there and I guess you will find the information you're looking for. Well, I'm at the end of this presentation. Me from my side, I want to thank you very much for your attention. I hope I was able to answer most of your questions. And of course, I would be very happy to welcome you at one of our future webinars again. For the time being, stay healthy, have a good time. Thank you and bye-bye.